Hello everybody out there in the great state of Texas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, all over. All you uh, fans of the Briscoe Western Art Museum, all the fans of the Yanaguana Indian Art Market, sorry that um, we couldn't be there just uh, this weekend in the uh, great city of San Antonio for the art market. Uh, a little bit about myself. My name is George Curtis Levi. I am uh, have been participating in the art market there in San Antonio for uh, maybe four years, and I uh, I do the uh, leisure art presentations there in the there in the building for the last two or three years. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody that's associated with the Briscoes, the uh, board of trustees, uh, Ryan and uh, everybody else there you know you're great great people great uh, great environment great museum tells the story of a uh, of uh, texas south texas west texas you know tells a uh, good story about uh, the plains you know the the, the cattle everything and uh, we're going to tell a story today we're going to talk about ledger art uh, the, the history of it uh, and it's where it is now and uh, like I said my name is uh, George Cheyenne Arapaho and I'm also Lakota Ogallala Lakota so uh, I want to talk about uh, history of ledger art many of you don't know what ledger art is um, it's pictographic art on paper uh, I have a, uh, a ledger book here right here it's a record book from uh, Meade, Kansas, the First National Bank, from 18, uh, 1919, actually. So, this art that I do, other contemporary artists do it, uh, it started in the 1840s amongst my people, the Cheyenne people. Uh, beforehand, my people, other Plains Indian people, People of the Americas did uh, did art, pictographic art. You know, uh, the the Mayans. You know, did art, pictographic art, Aztecs. You know, uh, people of the Americas, Central America, South America, North America, all did pictographic art. Rock carvings, rock walls, temples, mounds. Uh, those were all pictographic art. And uh, you'll see examples of my people did. You know. Uh, they were carved on uh, in sandstone bluffs, outcroppings, anywhere across the southern, northern, central plains, amongst uh, the, the western, western states, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, all the way down. Uh, then you also see examples of it on uh, shields, uh, uh, clothing. You will see quilled and beadwork, and uh, paint. Uh, Designs on, on dresses and shirts and pipe bags and leggings and moccasins. And then you will see examples of it on uh, uh, teepees, pictographic art. Like the, the teepees that uh, uh, is downstairs at the, uh, the Nevacoya boys, Tim and his brother Calvin, uh, painted there at the Briscoe. That is uh, pictographic art. Comanche style there. And... Uh, the earliest examples of a uh, ledger art is uh, a writing that comes from the 1840s. Uh, a U.S. military service member, he wrote about the son of Bear Wings, a young Cheyenne man, it was in a room at Dent's Court, and he was doing the lifelike drawings of, in a book. So those are the earliest uh, recorded writings about a person doing ledger art. And that is at Bent's Fort uh, near outside of uh, La Junta, Colorado. A major, major, major trading post for the, on the Southern Plains. And the earliest documented ledger art is also associated with the, the Cheyenne. It is a small, tiny, tiny book. Probably like five by six inches big. And it is associated with the and the uh, events that led up to the Sand Creek Massacre that happened in Colorado in 1864. In uh, August of 
of that year, uh, Cheyenne and uh, Arapaho Chiefs, with other tribal members, went to uh, the city of Denver, Colorado Territory, to a place called Camp Weld on the uh, South Platte River, which is basically located where, uh, right there where the uh, Denver football team, Denver Broncos play, right along that area right there. And they met with uh, as peace emissaries with the, uh, the territorial governor of Colorado and uh, uh, Colonel John Shivington. And they basically went there and told, uh, told the Colorado authorities that we wanted peace, the Cheyenne and Arapaho. And as a goodwill gesture, they had a five-year-old boy, a little Caucasian boy, a little white boy, along with them. And he was captured by the Kiowa. And the Cheyennes knew that they had him, so they bought him, ransomed him, uh, to take to Colorado as a gesture of goodwill. And when he was given up, given back to the authorities by the Cheyenne, Chief Black Kettle, uh, and different ones, they, uh, he had this book in his possession. And... It was probably given to him as a way to appease him, to make him, you know, um, uh, to take up some time, basically, you know, for the traumatic events that he had been through and seen, you know, when he was uh, being captured by the Kiowa. And uh, in that book, there are drawings, in graphite drawings, pencil drawings of uh, Cheyenne's fighting Pawnees. There are uh, hunting scenes in there. There are courting scenes. Of, uh, and just daily life scenes in that book. And that's, that's what Ledger Art is about. Uh, Ledger Art basically is a... Uh, like taking a picture with your phone today. It's like a, a moment of time, basically. So these, these men that... Um, these, these Cheyenne men, the Arapaho men, the Kiowa men, the Lakota men that did actively uh, do the ledger art from 18, 1840s, 50s, 60s, and 70s during the uh, great period of the, the high point of the Plains Indian. Uh, they, they put the pen and pencil aspects of their life, important events, whether they were... Um, Seeing their, their, their wife being, uh, giving birth, you know, having a new child or uh, a youngster, you know, killing his first bison or going on his first war raid or, you know, uh, tumultuous events like warfare against other tribes uh, or against the U.S. military and uh, attacks against and attacks against us. So that's what it was, you know. Um, they documented, you know, art. They documented events that happened in uh, Texas, West Texas, Southern Texas, Colorado Territory, New Mexico, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, you know, uh, Montana, Wyoming, you know, Colorado, all of the Great Plains. There was events that um, that happened, and our people. The Kiowa people, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, Lakota people, they, they, they drew what they saw. They drew what they lived. So it's like us having a phone uh, or tablets, you know, taking pictures. You know, everybody's, you see on Instagram and uh, Facebook, everybody's doing a picture, taking pictures of their food, taking pictures of a wedding, taking pictures of church and football, football sporting events. Well, it's the same thing happened back then, except for they drew it. And they drew what they what they lived. They drew what they saw and drew what they experienced, the good and the bad, you know. So, um, in a nutshell, you know, it spread from the Cheyennes. It spread to our traditional allies. It spread to the Arapaho. You see Arapaho men doing the same thing, you know, portraying their lives. It spread to the Kiowa. So you'll see Kiowa ledger or uh, the events that happened in Texas, you know, southern Texas. Kiowa and, and Comanche were, you know, were excellent warriors. They, they raided into Texas quite a bit. They raided into Mexico. 
the Cheyenne and Arapahoes also raided along with them into Texas and New Mexico, Old Mexico, and they, they have events like that, and highly detailed events. And uh, from that, it spread to our other allies, the, uh, the Western Lakota people, the Sichangu people, the Burnt Fly people, the Ogallala people, the Minwaju people, the, uh, the Yankton Sioux people. You know, those were our allies up there as well, the Cheyenne, because we occupied the Black Hills when the Sioux came into the into our country. And, uh, you know, they, uh, you see a lot of the historical art that is really, really valued by collectors and museums, and most of it is uh, warfare scenes. Uh, you see a lot of art that was produced uh, of our people fighting uh, the soldiers, you know, in the all over, you know, Wyoming, especially uh, after Little Big Horn, you'll see scenes of that, and uh, that's what they did. That's what those people they 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 did their events about, and uh, so um, that is a, the history of a little bit of the history of uh, ledger art. So nowadays we have uh, we have people that. Uh, are doing ledger art, contemporary people like myself. Um, I grew up seeing ledger art as a Cheyenne. I am descendant of some of the people that were ledger artists back in the, back in the uh, 1870s, 1860s. And, uh, you know, it's the same thing with me. You know, I, uh, I try to envision what the, my people saw back then, what they experienced back then, and, uh, you know, I will draw it and paint it and uh, use different medias, use acrylics, liquid acrylics, use a color pencil, watercolor, squash, and uh, I will uh, make that. As a Cheyenne, a Rappo, and Lakota person, I will do that. 90% uh, of my, uh, my art form, art, art that I do is a uh, based upon the Cheyenne people. And uh, so I, I will use our, our events, our symbols, and uh, produce the art like that. So I want to talk about how people were influenced by the, the period of uh, leisure art after the Indian Wars ended. So in about the 1920s, there is a re re a growth of uh, Native American art. Um, Santa in the 1920s, 1930s, the Kiowa Five down at the Jacobson House in uh, Norman, Oklahoma, did uh, a lot of uh, flat style painting. Uh, Bacone Art College in uh, uh, Muskogee, Oklahoma, did a lot of uh, work with Native American students, and also the Santa Fe Indian School. Did a lot of work with uh, Navajos and uh, uh, Hopis and uh, Pueblo Indians out that way. And uh, uh, prime examples, Gerald, uh, Gerald Naylor, and uh, as a flat style uh, uh, work that he did. I know he was uh, uh, Picaris Pueblo and uh, Navajo, and uh, he did work there in Santa Fe and also they uh, did work at the uh, in uh, Washington DC Department of the Interior building I believe and uh, so that that influenced a lot of our, our, our artists you know uh, and in turn the younger generation like me were influenced by them people too as well uh, Oklahoma is uh, where I'm from is known for a very prolific prolific artist and uh, You'll see other people out there, you know, other tribes that are um, not Cheyenne, not Arapaho, not Kiowa, not Lakota doing leisure art now. And it, it's really neat to see that, you know, see them take an art form that is not about them at all. And they put their twist on it. They will, you know, use their symbols and use uh, their imagination of something that they put their history in it. And it, it's pretty neat to see that happen, you know. 
and uh, it's 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 just a good thing. And uh, one point I, I, I want to touch on is um, it has to deal with Oklahoma and Texas is uh, it's this thing called uh, a place called Fort Marion Prison in St. Augustine, Florida. Uh, in 1874, in uh, Southwest, Western, Northwest, Oklahoma, Texas Panhandle, uh, High Plains, Northwest Texas, there is a, uh, an outbreak, you could say, of the, the Comanche, the Cheyenne, and the Kiowa. And uh, it was an, an active war, you could say, for a period of time. Uh, there was raiding by the, by the warriors of the three tribes, and there was also uh, counterattacks and movements uh, by the U.S. military. Uh, troops came from Oklahoma, out of Kansas, in Texas, and New Mexico. And, uh, you know, a lot of our people, a lot of you people from Texas, you guys know where Palo Duro Canyon is. And uh, there was a combined Cheyenne and Kiowa and Comanche village there that was hit in the fall of 1874. And there was also another uh, Cheyenne village that was hit there uh, uh, along McClellan Creek there as well. And with the coming of fall and winter and uh, our people being pushed and harried so hard by the U.S. military, our people started uh, going hungry, started being cold, our horses started giving out, and uh, piecemeal our people started filtering back to Oklahoma and started uh, turning themselves into military authority. Uh, the Kiowa and Comanche uh, uh, gave up uh, some of the Salt Creek along the Red, of the Red River, and some of them came into Darlington Indian Agency, the Cheyenne Arapaho Agency, and gave up there, and so did the, uh, the Cheyenne. And the Indian agents for the Kiowa and Comanches and the Cheyenne. Uh, talked to various members of their tribes and alongside the U.S. military and they found out who the ringleaders were. They found out who participated in which events that happened in Texas and Oklahoma. And they rounded up the, the so-called ringleaders uh, and maybe the, the warrior society men, the headsmen, or um, you know, just men that uh, participated in the events and also women too as well. They were, they were pointed out. And uh, there was roughly 70, 72 Cheyenne, Comanche, and uh, Kiowa people rounded up, shackled, put in chains, put on wagons, sent to the Little Blue River in south central Oklahoma, then uh, made up to Fort Gibson, then St. Louis, put on trains, Indianapolis, all the way down to uh, to Alabama, then ended up at Fort Marion Prison, and uh, they were there at St. Augustine, at uh, Castile San Marcos, otherwise known as Fort Marion, an old ancient uh, Spanish fort along the uh, northeast Florida coast, and. You know, the people were, were, were scared. They were destitute. You know, they didn't have much. And uh, Colonel Richard Pratt of the U.S. military, who happened to serve in Oklahoma and Texas before uh, with the cavalry, he uh, was in, put in charge of it. And he had a policy of uh, to kill the Indian and save the man. So basically he wanted to take away every part of the Indian that is Indian. And so he had the men uh, cut their braids, issued them, took away their clothing, issued them military style uh, uniforms and taught them how to drill and everything. So those guys were there for three years from 1875 until 1878. And some of them went on with him to Hampton. Uh, and some of them went on to Carlisle, some of the first students of Carlisle Indian School. And amongst them was uh, matches and different ones. And uh, while they were there at Fort Marion, 
he saw that the Indians you know, were getting along, you know, learning trades, uh, but they were still poor, pitiful, they couldn't have much, and surviving on rations and going to different places, working for uh, various people there. So he had the idea of letting them, you know, uh, make bows and arrows to sell. He took them out on the beaches to collect uh, seeds, which they polished and uh, sold to, to tourists. But he also let them, uh, gave them, he knew of their, uh, their history as artists. So he issued them paper and issued them pencils and crayons and inks and watercolors. And being the, the prolific artists they were, most of the Cheyennes and Kiowas, they, they set about uh, doing what is now known as ledger art. And uh, they sold individual pieces and some of them have sold outright books to uh, tourists uh, to make money to better their lives while they're in prison. And uh, so that is uh, what we know now as uh, the art, pleasure art of Fort Marion. And there were some really, really, really prolific artists there. Uh, amongst the Cheyenne, there was Howling Wolf, there was uh, Bear Tar, there was Coho, there was uh, Matches, there was Squint Eyes. And for the, the Kiowas, there was some really great artists there like Zotome and Owen Toyn and other ones. And the Comanches really didn't do too much ledger art. And it was mainly um, the Cheyenne and the, uh, the Arapaho, uh, the Kiowa. Uh, when the, the, the POWs, which were the Kaya, Cheyenne, Kiowa, and Comanches went there, there was also uh, two Arapahos that went there, a white bear and a packer, and they went there on uh, other charges. They weren't, didn't participate in the, the Red River War, and there was also another, another person who was a, a Caddo, and then he didn't participate in it either. And he, the Caddo didn't do no ledger art. But one of the, uh, well, most of the, uh, the rap hosts, they did a couple pieces of ledger art while they were there. So um, that's the history of ledger art, the way I know it. Um, so now I am going to do a quick piece of ledger art for all of us. So I have a, a pen. I have a piece of paper here. So we are going to ask you guys to, Watch this piece. Watch as I do a quick piece. So this paper here is from 1896, April 13th, a general balance book it's from uh, Kansas. So I'm going to just draw, do a quick drawing of a Cheyenne man. First of all, I'm going to draw his face. And he's going to be a high-ranking person, so he's going to be wearing a headdress. So the headdresses, they were, they were earned. They weren't just something to have. Not everybody had the right to wear a headdress. So, you know, America, a lot of Native Americans are thought, you know, when they, people think of Native Americans, they think of the Indians hunting buffalo, the Indians fighting the soldiers, and wearing the headdresses. And these are our people. A lot of our people in Oklahoma here, the, the Cheyenne the Arapaho, the Kiowa, the Comanche. Those are our people. Those are what people think of. Those are the, those are the uh, Lakota people. You know, the, so most Cheyennes, when they wore their headdresses, they had beaded designs on there. You see like little triangles. Those are symbolic of, uh, of mountains. And they wore their hair long 
And so this is going to be a man standing here. This man is wearing a blanket. It's cool out here. That's why I'm envisioning this. And this middle part, you'll see a beaded blanket strip. So this is a breach costume. And he's going to be standing here. Most of the Plains Indian men, they wore bone breastplates, symbolic of their protection, and they had long hair. man right here is holding something. Little stars all the way around. It's symbolic of a person who participated in a battle with the US military. And he has a cavalry guide on. So I will bring this up here. You will see. And this is what I drew. This is the man, the Cheyenne man. Or it could be an Arapaho man. Or it could be a Kiowa man. It could be a Comanche man or a Lakota man. So this is an example of the ledger art that I do. I have, in the past, sent down to Ryan some color sheets that I've First uh, did with the, when the stay at home orders, when the COVID got really bad. So I did uh, two sheets. One was uh, oriented for the Cheyenne designs and uh, the other one oriented with the uh, Repo designs. And they are handing those out, giving those out under the Briscoe. I am also gonna send more, uh, another one down tomorrow. And it's going to be up a buffalo. But I wanted to show a couple pieces of artwork. So um, my family, they are really talented. My kids and my wife is a talented beater. Uh, her, she has a pipe bag that is uh, currently featured in a uh, really, uh, really exquisite uh, Native American woman's art uh, exhibition called Hearts of Our People, and uh, curated by the Minneapolis Institute of Art, and she did a Cheyenne pipe bag of mine. I have my kids, um, Helston, Harding, and Abel. All three are great artists. My, uh, I'm going to show you little pieces of my little boy. His name is Abel. He's six years old, and we do art all the time. So this is Gary the Snail. This is what he did. Really proud of him. And he is something. This is a Disney castle that he did drawing. He, he takes my art, my paint, and uh, he does that. Uh, about four years ago, I had an, an ex exhibit at DU. This is a piece my, my boy did. Harding says, uh, everything is beautiful when, when there's love with the family. And uh, I have a 16-year-old daughter. Her name is Helson Grace. And... Uh, she is doing some really great art. So this is a piece of art that is a, she did with a scissor tail fly catcher. So wanted to show that and I want to show a few pieces of my art off to you guys for everybody to see. You know, I wish I was there to see you guys, everybody at the, 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 the market this year, but uh, looking forward to next year. So this is a piece of my art showing from this side over here, there's a Cheyenne Kit Fox Hedgeman. The next one is a uh, Cheyenne uh, Bowstring, then a Cheyenne Dog Soldier, and then a Cheyenne Elkhorn Scraper. 
I just done on a piece of paper from Montana and I used uh, gouache and acrylic paints for that. So this is called the big sister. So you got two little twin, twin girls that are, you know, feuding or whatever, whatnot, and the big sister steps in. So this is a Arapaho piece and this is called New Life. So it's pretty self-explanatory. You got a, a Arapaho man uh, and his wife who is, happens to be, be pregnant. So he had commissioned or had somebody make a fully beaded lattice cradle board and he surprised her with it. So she is so happy. She is so thankful that she is going to give him a, you know, give him a hug. And this here is a courting scene. This shows a Southern Cheyenne man and a Southern Cheyenne woman. And this is done in uh, gouache and liquid acrylics. And this last piece here, this is called Tisistus. Tisistus is what a Cheyenne people call ourselves. It means the people, like-hearted people. And this shows a scene of the foothills, which could be anywhere from the Black Hills, the Bighorn Mountains, Rocky Mountains, you know, anywhere. So this shows a family scene. And I want to talk just a little bit about um, uh, where one can find some really, really uh, great original pieces of art, leisure art. There is a place, a uh, website called uh, Plains Leisure Art, www.plainsleisureart.com. Dot org. And that is a, a website that is hosted by the University of California, San Diego. Ross Frank heads it up. And there are maybe 30 ledger books, historical ledger books from the 1860s, 1870s, that are digitized. The tribes included are the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, the Kiowa, and the Western Lakota people. So that it's there for research. Um, you can go up there and read the read the captions and uh, they will tell you about who they were and where they come from, where the books were collected at, who the artists were if they if they know. And that's a great great place. And also you can find me at uh, my, my daughter Helson's uh, artwork at www.glevi.artspan a r t s p a n dot com. And uh, you know I just uh, wish I could be there in San Antonio. I love that city. I love the museum. Um, Brian and everybody there associated with the Frisco are, are great. You know, if you have time, you make it there to the museum. Go go to the gift shop. You know, take a tour of the the museum. You know, uh, enjoy the river walk. You know, but um, at the same time, you know, I just wish everybody to be safe, be COVID aware. Um, if you have to go out, please mask up. Uh, Go to, go to a store, go someplace. Please, you know, take along some Lysol or some spray, disinfecting spray. Spray your spray your feet when you come back in your house. Wash your hands, you know, uh, at least twenty seconds, and uh, you know, just be COVID aware. Uh, it will it will be over soon, sometime with uh, hopefully with the new vaccines and. Uh, but uh, enjoy, enjoy this, enjoy the virtual market, and enjoy the virtual everything that's happening this weekend. And, uh, you know, I just want to uh, say thank you to everybody that is associated with uh, the Briscoe. Thanks to all the people, you, all you good people out there for uh, watching this. And, uh, yeah, I just uh, wish the best to you and all of yours. Thank you.